Okay, so we finished reading the story, but now we need to make sure that we have gotten everything from it that we need to get from it. So what we're going to do is we are going to first go back over some of the stuff we talked about at the beginning. We're going to make sure that we've got all of the components that we need, all of the different elements of a short story. And then we're going to talk about some of the things that we can do as a final project and how that is going to work. All right, we are going to first take a look at our goals to make sure that we are meeting what we have set out to accomplish. Our first goal is to learn about the elements of a short story and how to identify them. We're going to go through these one at a time here in just a second, so we'll come back to that one. We also want to examine the themes of the story and their value. And finally, we want to look at the impact of the story on pop culture. So we want to get all three of these goals accomplished, and how we are going to do that is we're going to make sure that we list them, that we label them, and that we identify each component by answering the questions associated with it. So let's look at the elements of a short story. So to start off with, we have our plot diagram here. We're going to look at the pieces of this, and we're going to answer each of the questions associated with it, by talking about the events of the story that fall under each of the categories. You can either do your plot diagram by drawing out or using a computer to make something similar to what we just saw, or you can just go through and list it like this. Either way is fine. The first one that we want to talk about is our exposition. So the exposition, remember, is the information that we get at the very beginning of the story. What sets us up? What do we need to know about our characters and about our setting and all of that. Our exposition here takes place differently than our actual setting for the story. So we want to include that as well. And then we have our inciting incident. That's number two. The inciting incident being the thing that really triggers the events of the story. Something goes strange, something goes awry, something happens to change the course of events as they were originally laid out. From there, we have our rising action. These are all of the events that happen in between our inciting incident and our climax. So there's going to be kind of a list here of the different things that occur in the story. Then we get to our climax. This is how we can identify where the story has been building to. What is the ultimate piece of action that's going to resolve our situation? Then we end up with our falling action and our resolution. Because the Most Dangerous Games kind of truncated, our ending is really, really chopped off, and it's just a very short bit, we're going to combine those two into just one little piece of information. After our climax, what happens at the very end? After we've got all of these, then we can move on. Next, we have our setting. Our setting is obviously where our story takes place, and Initially, you might think that there's only the two parts of the setting, but if you think about it, that second part is actually a bunch of different locations all in one bigger location. So we want to include all of those as well. And then finally is when the story takes place. Now, no specific year is given through the course of the story. We instead have to use our skills of deduction to try to figure out Based on what Richard Connell wrote in the story, when do we think that this took place? We talked about that as we were reading through the story, so we want to include that in there as well. We also have our characters, who they are and what is important about them. With our characters, there are four that we want to include. We have Rainsford, we have General Zaroff, but we also have Whitney and we have Ivan. So after we've identified just their names, we want to talk about what's important about them. What do they add to the story? What have we learned about them through the course of the story? We have our theme. So if you remember, one of our goals was to be able to identify the theme of the story and to talk about why it's important and how we know that it is a theme. So a theme, remember, is the subject of the piece and an idea that recurs throughout the piece. Themes can usually be summed up into one or two words, something very simple like uh, warfare. 
which isn't an actual theme of the most dangerous game. It's just an example. So what I would like you to do here is try to identify a theme, but you also want to talk about how you know it's a theme. You want to be able to justify it. So you can either discuss in the most dangerous game, this and this and this happened, which show us the theme, or you can take bits and pieces that you copy and paste from the PDF, and you can include that in your explanation of the theme. Either of those will work, whatever is easiest, as long as we are able to identify the theme and show this is how we know that it's a theme. We also have perspective. This one we've also answered while reading the story, and it shouldn't be super difficult if you don't remember it, which of these four it is. So we wanna make sure that we can identify which of those is our perspective. Finally, we wanna address our conflict. So our conflict, if we look through these, is who or what we're struggling against. And we have four that are fairly simple to identify. We have our person versus person. That one's a pretty big one throughout the story. We have our person versus self. Now this one's a little bit trickier, but throughout the course of the story, our characters do struggle against themselves, their emotions, their feelings. So we can try to identify that. We have person versus society. This one's also fairly obvious because we have what society says is the moral thing to do, is the right or the wrong thing to do versus what our characters either choose to do or are forced into. And then finally, we have person versus nature. Again, this one's fairly overt and it shouldn't be super difficult to find out. So what we wanna do is just pick one of these and demonstrate an example, kind of like we did with the theme of either just explaining it in your own words or copy and pasting a specific section that you think demonstrates that struggle. We also have our other three types of conflict. And this is one of the reasons that I really like this story is because if you want an extra challenge, we can pick these other conflicts and use these as well. So we have person versus supernatural. Now in this story, there's not a lot of supernatural influence. There's not uh, any demons or werewolves or ghosts or anything of the sort. But what we can do instead is we can compare these to the influences that the Most Dangerous Game drew on. So think of those authors, Bram Stoker or Edgar Allan Poe or Arthur Conan Doyle or H.P. Lovecraft, any of those that liked to write using supernatural influences and that Richard Connell probably took those ideas from and used to help influence his own story. We can use those to help show us the person versus the supernatural conflict, even if it's not directly in the story. We also have person versus technology. Now, there's only one real instance that I can think of in this story where you have person versus technology and it's a little bit difficult to find but if you really want a challenge, you can try to hunt this one down. And then finally, we have person versus fate. Now remember, fate doesn't always have to be a prophecy or a prediction about what will happen to a person through the course of their life. Sometimes it's the idea of something inevitable happening, some, something that somebody has to fight against in order to avoid disaster. So if we look at it that way, we can find some examples of person versus fate through the course of this story. So now that we've got through our goals, we've learned about the elements of a short story and how to identify them. We've examined the themes of the story and their value, and we've shown how we know that those are the themes. We get to our last piece. Here, we're gonna look at the impact of the story on pop culture. Throughout the course of the reading, I talked about different places where Richard Connell drew on different influences in his writing. Since the story has come out, movies and television and authors all over the world love to draw on this and use this as inspiration from their own writing, and in some cases, just directly rip it off. What I would like you to do here is think about that and see if you can come up with different times that you've seen these ideas reused. What are some TV shows that you've seen this in? What are some movies or some stories that you've seen this in? So just write about one or maybe two and explain how that story compares to this one. This doesn't have to be very long, two or three sentences at the most. 
After we finish that piece, we're going to move on to our final project. So we have our five senses when we talk about sensory detail. There are more senses than that, which is an interesting fact, but really doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about today. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those five senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch, and we are going to look through our story of the most dangerous game and try to show where they are exemplified in the story. Where does Richard Connell bring those up to try to bring the story to life? If we're doing a really good story, we want to make sure that we're including those because they help add texture, add flavor to our story, as it were. But we're going to go a little bit farther than that. Not only are we going to show where Richard Connell showed those in our story, but what I want you to do is I want you to also wander around your house or the location that you're at, and I want you to try to find five things that you can use your senses to describe. So tell me how some, something smells. Tell me how something looks. And for each of those, I want you to try to write one paragraph describing the feeling or the sensory experience of those things. Tell me what eating some sort of food tastes like. Tell me what you hear when you sit in a quiet room. Tell me what you feel when you reach down and rub your hands on your carpet or pet your dog or something like that. We want to focus on those, not only in how Richard Connell has used them, but how they can influence our own writing. In this one, you're going to pick an example of how Richard Connell demonstrates touch, sight, smell, hearing, and taste in the story of the most dangerous game. So just to be clear, that's one example for each. You're also going to copy a textual example for each sense. So what that is saying is that you're going to go through the text, through the PDF, and you're going to copy a line demonstrating each of those. After that, you are going to write your own example for each of these senses using at least three sentences for each. So as an example, I wrote, my cat's soft fur cushions my hand as I pet her. She is warm and I can feel her purr. The loose fur, the loose fur clings to my fingers when I pull away. So there's three sentences that all describe the sense of touch of something that was around me, which at the time was my cat. So you're going to do that for each of the different senses. The goal of this is to practice writing skills and the utilization of details to paint a more vivid picture with words. Being able to write with sensory details helps a lot when you start practicing creative writing. It also helps a lot with understanding the context of what you're writing because you can help create a better picture and a better understanding of the subject matter. For project two, we're going to discuss Marcus Aurelius. So here you are going to find quotes from Marcus Aurelius's meditations and compare these quotes to Rainsford or General Zaroff's personalities. Remember that Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor who was famous for his philosophies, and it's also the person that General Zaroff was reading from at the very end of the story. This reference wasn't picked by accident. Things don't just happen in creative writing they usually come to mean something. So when Richard Connell picked for General Zaroff to read Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, he did it for a reason. So here, you're going to take at least five quotes that need to be picked for this assignment, and at least one paragraph for each one needs to be written. So all I did was go to a search engine and type in Marcus Aurelius' Meditation quotes, and a whole list of them came up. One example, is that everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not a truth. And then I wrote that this quote applies to both Rainsford and General Zaroff, who view the morality of the idea of human hu hunting uh, for sport as a matter of perspective. Zaroff believes that it is ethical for the strong to use the weak for their own enjoyment. Rainsford al also believed that, which he said when talking to Whitney, but then changed his mind when he understood what happens when somebody's stronger holds that perspective. The goal here is to explore the themes and their value in literature and compare them to previous works. So in this case, we are going to be exploring both the themes in Marcus Aurelius' Meditations to the themes and information that we got from The Most Dangerous Game, and we're going to compare the two. Finally, we have our found journal. 
So here you are going to write a two to three page journal detailing your experience trying to escape from some creature. After, distress the piece so that it appears to be the found remnants of some story. The goal here is to demonstrate a mastery of the elements of a short story and practice creative writing in a new medium. In order to complete this activity, you have to have an understanding and even a mastery of the plot elements of a short story in order for your own story to make sense. So we take the information that we've learned and we're applying it. But we're doing it in kind of a creative way, something that's a little bit in more interesting than just writing a paper or writing a normal basic front to back, top to bottom story. This is one of my favorite activities. And generally, I'm very impressed by the creativity that my students have shown. Let's take a look at some examples of what you could do with a found journal project. Here we have a student that tied together their pages with twine. They aged it using coffee, and then they burned the edges and rubbed some smudge marks on the front to give it more of a charred look. On this one, we have a student who crumpled it up and tore the edges rather than burned it, still giving it a distressed look. Here we have a student who used food coloring and water instead of coffee to give it kind of a different texture and appearance. On this one, the student used glue and sand to give the piece an appearance of being found on a beach, which fit within the theme of the story. Here's another one where the student used burning to really, really good effect. But they also tied it together using twine. One of my personal favorites was this one, which was, as you can see, a lost at sea piece. Here we have a student who decided to handwrite and use illustrations instead of using a computer to create her story. Students have used red paint for blood splatter. This is a student who decided to distress an entire notebook instead of just a few pages. The entire notebook wasn't written in just the first couple of pages, but the effect was still pretty great. Here's another student who decided to use red paint to create the image of blood, which went well with the story. All right, we have successfully read our first short story together. We have applied the things that we've learned and we've been able to create something using them. We'll see you next time.